church. God is good. Amen. And all the time. Amen. Well, I'm excited today as we get to wrap up the Theology Matters series. I'm excited. We'll still be answering questions online. So if you haven't heard the answer to the question you asked, stay tuned online and check that out on Facebook. Those videos are coming up on a weekly basis. So we put out a video this week. Somebody asked about cremation. Is it okay for a Christian to be cremated? Great question. If you've got questions in regards to that, go watch that video. It's about eight minutes long. Awesome video answering those questions. As we continue to worship, we're not passing the offering plate right now. So we do ask that you take the time to drop your offering either in the plate in the front on the altar here or in the back. We'll collect that after service, or you can give online or through the mail. But we encourage you, continue to be faithful as we continue through this time of this pandemic. And I am, one of the most exciting things, I know I say this every week, but I really mean it, is when we worship together right now, it's the whole family. And I love that. I love the kids. I love the grandparents. It's a beautiful picture of the family of God worshiping together. And we believe wholeheartedly that the best thing we can do for our children is give them healthy parents. And what they see, kids need to see mom and dad worshiping. They need to see mom and dad praying. They need to see mom and dad reading their Bible. And they get to see all of that together in worship. And so Michelle's our children's ministry director. and She's got some information for parents and grandparents. Morning, everybody. So one of the ways that we try to equip parents to do that, to be um, the influencers for their children in, the, in their um, walk with God, is that we have a parent meeting. And so this is called a parent meeting, but it is for everybody. It's for anybody who has influence in the life of a child. So grandparents, aunts, uncles, children's ministry workers, whoever. So we're inviting you on September, let me find the date, September 27th to a parent meeting. And lunch is provided and it's free and we're going to have resources to talk about and all kinds of um, ways to encourage parents and families in the life of their children awesome thank you michelle michelle will also have for you next week we start the book of genesis and i'm so excited as we work through genesis our life groups are kicking up next week so if you do not or if you're not part of a life group please sign up for a life group we'll get you plugged in today to a life group. They meet all, all throughout the week at different times and different places. We've got a life group for everybody. And you can sign up by either filling out the communication card and the next steps is I want to join a life group. Or you can meet with Nevin at the back today at the end of service, the next steps area, to find out what life groups are available. So we encourage you, get involved with life groups. And Michelle next week, because we're starting Genesis out and kicking life groups off, we'll have some more resources for parents to give away back there. If you like the card book we gave out for toddlers on theology, one God and two natures of Jesus and three persons, it was awesome. I've heard a lot of good stuff. We got a new one for Genesis next week to give out for parents as well, as well as something for older kids, um, just to encourage parents as we walk alongside each other in Genesis. But will you stand with me today as we prepare our hearts for worship? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Today's another gift from you to bring glory to our creator. And even as we've joined together this morning, we've come together as the body of Christ to worship you. God, coming here this morning is not about what we get out of it, not about the experience, not about the emotion, not about the feeling. It's about us worshiping our God, hearing your word so we can know you better singing your truths so we can plant them in our hearts so as we go throughout the week, we are reminded of who you are in our lives. And so God, today, let us come together as your people and offer down a sacrifice of worship and praise before you with all that we are. God, may your word just wash over us. May your spirit be in this place. And may all that we think and do today bring you great honor and glory. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray today. Amen. Morning, church. Please join us in singing. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our 
church. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Mark Dominguez, and I am the youth minister here at South Peoria. Um, and it's wonderful just to be here with you guys to worship the Lord together. And uh, we're going to be reading out of the book of Micah this morning, chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 1. The book of Micah, chapter 6 and verse 1. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, oh, hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Let's pray, church. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the privilege that it is to come together, Lord, and bring you glory and to worship you, Lord. We pray that this morning, Lord, that you would give us a heart, Lord, heart of humility as we approach your word, as we approach your scripture, Lord. Help us understand, Lord. Help us give you glory, Lord, as we are helpless. Help us, Lord, to understand your word. Help us to uh, practically live it out in the world, Lord. 
Help us today, Lord. We give you the honor and you the glory. In your name we pray. Amen.
all the attention in this world. You are worthy of all the honor and praise and glory. So God, please forgive us for the times this week where we've taken the glory for ourselves. Forgive us for the times this week when we haven't honored you with our thoughts and our actions and our attitudes. God, forgive us for our arrogance and our pride before you. God, bring us into your presence. Bring us into conformity with your son this morning. Teach us your word. Teach us how to think biblically, to think correctly according to your word. Teach us to love you as you have called us to. Pray these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, what a good day. Let's dive into the depths of God's word this morning as we continue in our Theology Matters series. And today we're wrapping this up. And as I said, we'll still be answering those questions as we move forward, so look for those online. Um, But today as we deal with Theology Matters, we may be dealing today with maybe the most important topic of this series and maybe even the most difficult for us to wrestle with today, and that is this. Today we're going to wrestle with the question of what is a biblical worldview of the social justice movements that are going on in our world today? What does God's words say, really say, about how we should be interacting with our world and how we should be loving our world? And so, if you're here today, I'm encouraging you to do a couple of things. Number one, I'm encouraging if you're here with us in person, that you listen through this, you wrestle through this this week. I'm encouraging that when you get home today that you share the links to this sermon with your family, your friends, whether they're Christian or not Christian, because today we're going to take a look for us to see as Christians and for the world to see this is what God's Word says. If you're online with us right now, I encourage you to send those links out. You People can watch with you, but let's wrestle with the goodness of God's Word together, and let's share it with other fellow believers and Christians and the lost of this world. And so where I want to start this morning is in a very basic place where we've come from before, but that is this. If you're writing down your notes, and I hope you are, I want you to start right here and write this down. A Christian must have a biblical worldview. A Christian must have a biblical worldview. What that means is for me to be a Christian, for you to be a Christian, Where we find how we understand God, how we understand who we are, and how we understand who the world is and what we exist as and interact with as the world can only come from one place. That worldview has to be developed by God's word and God's word alone. The Bible is the authority that we have as Christians, which means whenever we have a question, whenever we experience something, the appropriate question is never this, how does this make me feel? Or what do I think about? The appropriate question for us as Christians should always be, what does God's word say? And so that leads us to a place to understand, as a Christian, God's word is my authority. So if I'm going to be a Christian, if I'm going to claim to be a Christian, that means that God's word tells me how to view the world. So I have to have a biblical worldview because that's what it means to be a Christian. As I follow Jesus, he is the authority. His word is the authority. I don't get to make it up as I go. Which leads me to the next point. That is this. The only way I can think correctly is through God's word. As Christians, the only way you and I can know God correctly, can think correctly, can believe correctly, or feel correctly is according to his word. He's the one who created us. He's the one who's given us his word so we can know him correctly. The only way we can do that is through his word. Last week when we were talking about Satan, one of the take-homes, the tools for for, uh, today, was I don't need Satan's help. I can do evil all by myself, right? And we all represent that. Well, That's true, but maybe even more offensive is this truth. I don't need Satan's help. I think incorrectly all by myself. How I think and view the world all by myself in my mind is wrong. That's pretty offensive, isn't it? The only way we can think correctly as believers we know is through God's word. 
And so what God's word becomes is our authority. It becomes our worldview. It develops our worldview so we can interact with all of the world. So anything that comes up, we're seeing through the filter of God's word and how he says, I need to understand this. How he says, I need to think about this. How he says, I need to feel about this. And so I need, the only way I can think correctly is through God's word. And that brings us to the passage that we're reading today in Micah chapter 6. And I love this passage as we deal with a biblical, a biblical worldview of the social justice movements of this world. I want to go back and read what Mark read for us earlier. It's powerful. This is the prophet Micah, and he's talking to Israel. Actually, this is God speaking to Micah. He says, listen to what the Lord says. God commands Micah, stand up. Plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear you, mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. What we've got right here is a real deal, live action, law and order episode happening. And creation, the mountains and the earth are the jury. And he's saying, God has told me I need to stand up as the prophet of Israel. God has brought a legal case against his people. So listen, all of creation, to what this charge is. And God speaks. And he says, my people, what have I done to you? Have I burdened you? And then he says, answer me. Now in my house, when dad says, I asked you a question. There's usually a little bit of fear going on in that moment, right? The authority of dad comes out when there has been an accusation made, and you need to answer for this. I cannot imagine ever having to stand before the God of creation who is demanding an answer from me, and his question is, what have I ever done wrong to you? There is no answer. Silence from my part. So he continues, I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you and also Aaron and Miriam. My people remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shinnom to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. So God has lodged his complaints. You've forgotten who I am. You have sinned against me. You've rejected me. And Micah's response now is this. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? How should I do this? He has laid a charge against me. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? Will a burnt offering make it right with God? Will calves a year old make it right with God? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? Will that make me right with God? Will 10,000 rivers of olive oil make it right? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? How do I get right with God because of my sin? None of these things will do. And then this statement, Micah 6, 8, it's a very, very popular statement right now, very popular verse. And it says, he has shown you O mortal, what is good? What does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. This brings us to a very important point that we need to understand as Christians, as believers in Christ, and that is this, write this down, God commands and requires justice. Scripture tells us that justice and righteousness flows from his throne. The very at, one of the very attributes of who God is is he is just. And he requires that of his creation. If we are going to be believers in Christ, if we're going to claim to be Christians, we must do justice. So what is justice? What does justice look like? We see it throughout all of scripture. There's a sense of legal justice, penitent justice, to where, and this is a general term, a a dictionary term of justice would be to give someone what is due 
them. There's an idea that eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, that is justice. When somebody does something that is not right, they get what is due them. But then there's also an idea of justice, of doing right by others. We see in Proverbs 31, 8 through 9, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up for, and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Jeremiah says it this way in chapter 22. This is what the Lord says. Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place. So there's not just a, a, a legal idea of justice, but there's a sense that as believers, as God's children, that we do what is right. And so I want us to understand justice in a biblical sense. This is what it means to be just according to God. And so write this down. Justice is doing or making right according to God's standard. That's what justice is. Justice is doing or making right according to God's standard. See, the problem with justice is this, if just the understanding of basic justice is this, is somebody getting what they are due, by what standard are they measured do we determine what they are due? The only way we can understand justice is because we have a just God. And so we need to understand as Christians and as creator, creatures of the creator, justice flows from God. The only way we can understand justice correctly is through God. It's a vertical understanding in relationship with God. And so justice is doing or making right according to God's standards. Now here's where we run into the biblical problem. And you, you, want, you want to know what the problem is? The problem is it's the person sitting next to you. Turn to them. This is the problem. Turn to them and say, hey, you're a sinner. Ooh, some of you got uncomfortable just now. Ooh, I'm not allowed to say that to them, right? Here's the problem with justice. is sin. Sin is the problem. Why is sin the problem? It's because you and I have fallen short of God's standard. We have not come anywhere close to God's standard. If justice is doing or making right according to God's standard, we have not done or made right according to God's standard in any way, shape, or form. And our creator is the one that has set the boundaries for all of mankind. He set the boundaries and the law and says, this is the standard, this is what is required of you. And we have rejected God, denied him. We have broken his boundaries and his laws. And so the problem of justice is now we're do something. And what are we do? Because his justice demands we get it. So this is what we are due. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin. Most of you in here have a job or have had a job at some point in your life. Your wages are what you are due. At the end of the week, your boss is not giving you a gift. If I don't get my paycheck, we're going to have problems. That's not just, is it? Because I am due something for my work. The wages, what you are due for your sin, is death. But the good news is the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You and I deserve one thing from God because he is just. We deserve destruction. We deserve death. But there's good news. Because not only are we to do justly, but to love mercy. See, this is what he's commanding us in Micah 6, 8, is a reflection of who he is. And God gives us an immense amount of mercy. If justice is giving us what we are due, mercy is the opposite. Mercy is the withholding from which you are due. And the mercy of God is seen in this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21 says this, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. All this is from God. And listen, who reconciled. Everyone say reconciled. That's an important word you need to understand. What did he do? God reconciled us to himself 
through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So we see a just God says you are due death, but a merciful God and just God says, but I've got a plan and I have a plan to reconcile those who deserve, who are due death. And so through Jesus Christ on the cross, I will forgive the sin. Sin has to be dealt with. It has to be punished. In other words, God is not just. So he will deal with sin, and he deals with sin on the cross in Jesus Christ. And the whole purpose was to reconcile us, the unjust, so we can be right with God. It's all about being, being made right doing right according to God's standard. And so he says, Christ reconciled you, and now he has given you the message and the ministry of reconciling others to God. That's an amazing idea. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against him. That's his mercy. And as he committed to us the message of reconciliation, we therefore... Believers in Christ, born again, we are ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf. Who? The world. I'm an ambassador of Christ. I've been made right with God, and I've been given the, the, the ministry of reconciliation. And how do I do that? I proclaim, be reconciled to God. And how does that happen? That God made him, who is Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that we, in him, we might have become the righteousness of God. The greatest exchange in all of history, the most unfair, the most inequitable action in all of history is that Christ died on the cross for your sins. And in his place, you get his righteousness. There is nothing fair about that. There is nothing equitable about that. Christ saves us through what he did on the cross by overcoming our sins. Romans 3.28 puts it this way. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law, not by actions, not by works. How are we justified? That word justified is the action of justice, of making, declaring, and judging rights. You're made right by faith in Jesus Christ. And this is powerful, church, as we wrestle with this. Listen, write this down. We are justified, judged right by God through faith in Jesus. Do you hear that, church? I hope you love this. You are justified, which means you are judged right despite your sin, despite all the unjust things you're guilty of, despite what you're due because of your sin, how are you made right in the eyes of a holy God? Through faith in Jesus Christ. And you receive his righteousness, which means you have been made right according to God's standards, not by what you have done, but because of who Christ is and what he did on the cross. That is how we are made and justified right by God. So, this is part of our biblical worldview. This is the foundation of our biblical worldview, that God requires justice. Not only does he have to deal with sin, but now that we are believers justified, he requires justice from us. So let's be clear about what it means for us to be Christians that follow Jesus. And right now, the world needs to hear this from us louder than ever because it needs to bring great clarification so that we can stand on God's word and the world can see the power of the gospel. First and foremost, as Christians, we understand this. We stand against and we fight against racism of any kind. You hear that, church? We stand against and fight against racism of any kind. To hate somebody because they look different, to be prejudiced towards someone because they look different, is a devaluing we learned two weeks ago of the Imago Dei, the image of God. We are all image bearers of God and our value is based on that and that alone. My value is not based on any other identity I may identify with. It is based on the image of God and God alone. So for us to devalue anyone in any way because of race is a sin against the image of God. We stand against that, we fight against it. 
Romans, or John, 1 John 4.20 says, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. We stand against and fight against sexism of any kind. To devalue any kind of, of woman or child or anybody because of their gender is an offense against the image of God. We stand against and fight against slavery of any kind, whether it's sex slavery or whether it's actual slavery and it's real and exists still today in other parts of the world. We fight against it. We stand against it that the image of God has been oppressed in that way. We stand against oppressing people. We fight against oppression. We speak for the fatherless. We stand for the widow and the orphans. And we do all of this because God commands and requires justice from us. We don't pass it by as if nothing happened. As a Christian, if you come in contact with racism, it's your requirement by God to stand up and say, that's wrong. That's wrong come in contact with sexism, we stand up and we say, that's wrong. Anything that devalues the image of God is wrong. Any oppression of the image of God is wrong. So this brings us to an important question right now. In the world in which we live, there are social justice movements in the midst of great unrest in our nation with things that are going on in the politics, in the daily lives, in all of the things that are happening around here, the question comes up. So we see the social justice movement stand against oppression. They fight against oppression. We see God's word commands Christians to do justice. They, we stand against oppression. We see Jesus specifically has a heart for the oppressed, and he's come to minister to the oppressed. So here's the question. Should Christians who have based our understanding of the world, a biblical worldview on God's word, should we embrace the social justice movements of this world? That's a good question, isn't it? We see a world out there who is hurting. Should we embrace this movements. Hmm. Well, let's pause here for a second. And before we move forward, let me just give a simple warning for us to heed, okay? And I want you to write down this warning as we think about it. A Christian should take notice when what we think aligns with what the world thinks and realize something's wrong. Do you hear that? I'm going to say it again. Process through the statement. A Christian should take notice when what we think aligns with what the world thinks. And that should be a warning sign that sends off bells in our heads or red flags in our mind that goes, something's not right. If what I'm thinking is aligning with the world, something's not right. And remember, if the only way I can think correctly, the only way I can have a biblical worldview is thinking through according to God's word, the world cannot do that, can they? So if what they're thinking is the same thing I'm thinking, then what I'm thinking is probably not correct according to God's word. Do you understand that warning, church? So, with that warning in place, here's my hope today, is that we take this, and if you're a believer who has embraced the social justice movements of this world, I hope you wrestle with this as we unpack the truth of God's word. If you're a believer who has not embraced the social justice movements of this world, but you just look at it and you go, I don't know why, I just haven't, I hope for us to build a foundation to understand why it's so important for us to stand on God's word alone. If you're somebody who has embraced it and you go, man, it sounds so good because we're fighting for the oppressed. It feels so good because we're making a difference. That humanity is getting better when we do it this way, when we work with the world, when we are not silent in this. 
and yet in that embracing, you're standing there and go, but something is off. Something's not quite right. I hope this begins to help give you the ability and the tools to wrestle out of that and stand firmly on God's word alone. And so, here's where we begin to understand the difference between what God's word says justice is and what the world says justice is. And so, we defined earlier justice as being doing or making right according to God's standard, right? See, here's the thing with what the world does is the world takes words and they change the meanings or twist the meanings to mean something different and try to entice us in by as if they mean the same thing as we think they do. I heard a sermon this week on social justice and they go, if you are in social justice, they, they quoted the, uh, one of my favorite movies, The Princess Bride. He's a wise quote, Imago, Imago Montoya, whatever his name is. And he says, you keep saying that word, but I do not think that word means what you think it means. And that's what they do, is they use words with different meanings and entice us in. And so where they define, we define it as doing or making right according to God's word, social justice has a different meaning, and they twist justice to fit the narrative that they have. And what is the narrative of the world? We can build the foundation. It's very easy and simple for us to understand this. When we look at God's word and we have a biblical worldview, we understand if the only way we can think correctly is through God's word and the only way we can know God is through his word, then the narrative of the world will always be this, to deny God. To deny God working overtime to remove God from everything. We'll see when we get to Genesis, the most offensive verse in all of Scripture is in the beginning, God. Come back next week to find out why. And humanity wants to deny God in everything that we do. And so they twist even the meaning of words. So William Young defines social justice this way. Social justice has evolved generally to mean state, that means government, state redistribution of resources, advantages, and dis to disadvantaged groups to satisfy their right to social and economic equality. I'm going to read this again. This is the general uh, agreed upon definition, the purpose of social justice. Social justice has evolved generally to mean the state, the government, redistribution of resources, advantages to disadvantaged groups to satisfy their rights to social and economic equality. It's so important. There's important words in there. You need to understand what social justice does. The words are that you need to understand it's about resources. It's about advantages. Maybe the most important and scariest part is it's about groups. It's not about people. It's not about you. It's not about an individual person. It's about groups and power structures. And so the ideology of social justice is actually built on the back of something called critical theory. And these ideologies and theories that are actually all modern day, are actually all modern day expressions of old philosophy. There's nothing new. And we have something called liberation theology that came around in the 60s and the 70s. And it's just a modern day expression of these things. But we can actually trace it back to somebody that this is all built on the philosophy of. And this is scary for me. It's all built on the philosophy of a guy named Karl Marx. Now you know who he is. He's the creator of Marxism. Right? And so, but do you know who he is? Now, all of these things in the basis of critical theory, the basis of intersectionality, the basis of social justice movements, it doesn't matter which one you name or whichever one you claim, they're all based on his philosophy. Karl Marx saw two major evils with this world. The two major evils he saw with this world is number one, religion, and number two, the free market. So Karl Marx shares with us what his prime objective is in his life. And this is it. I've got a quote of him up here. This is his quote. My object in life is to dethrone God and destroy capitalism. First dethrone God, then the free market. 
Now, I could really care less. I'm a theologian. I'm not an economist. So I'm not here to talk about capitalism. I'm here to under, for us to understand. That's not new, is it? Why did Satan fall? We learned last week. He wanted to dethrone God and lift himself up. Why did Adam and Eve fall? Because surely you will be like God. And who we are as humanity is always to deny God, to dethrone God, and to lift ourselves up in his place. So how do you dethrone God? How do we remove God? Well, it's really simple. You just change the equation and take him completely out of it, right? If this is God's creation and we're going to reject that, then let's just remove God. So, let's see this from a biblical perspective. Social justice changes the purpose of mankind and changes the, mirror, the, the, the definition to fit its narrative. So in a biblical worldview... The problem we already discussed is this. In a biblical worldview, write this down, sin is the problem. Sin separates us from God. We have transgressed God. We have to remove that from a non-biblical worldview. In a social justice, this is what happens. In social justice, there is no sin problem. It is not about being right with God. Social justice says the problem is not horizontal. The problem is vertical. It's not about sin. Social justice says the problem is this. Write this down. It's how we treat each other. This is the problem. This is the oppression we're fighting against the oppression of one man on another man. We're fighting the oppression of groups on groups. We're fighting the systemic injustice of disadvantages between people groups. And if we can even that out, then we fix the problem. What is missing? Everyone will still go to hell. Sin is the problem. Social justice says, no, that's not the problem. It's how we really treat each other. We can overcome this. And hear me. Oppression is a result of sin, and it is an issue we have to deal with. And as Christians, we fight against that. We fight against it. So a biblical worldview sees the only solution. The only solution for sin is this. Write this down. Is the gospel. If the problem is between me and God, there's only one way to overcome it. That's through Jesus Christ. He paid the price. Free gift of eternal life. I follow him and give my life to him. That's the solution. Through that, I'm transformed. He removes the hate from my heart that I have towards other people. He removes the evil desires that I have to oppress other people and push other people down. That is the solution. That is the problem. And the only thing that will fix it is the gospel. But in social justice, since the sin's not the problem... Justice, the solution, salvation, is found through this. The redistribution, listen, the redistributions, write this down, resources, wealth, and power. That is the goal of social justice, to redistribute resources, wealth, and power. There is no salvation in that. There is no salvation in that. As I said, we would be successful in doing that, and all of the world, the whole world, still goes to hell. Social justice not only changes the terms of justice, but it also changes and redefines love. A biblical worldview of love is found in 1 Corinthians 13, and this is what it says in the love chapter. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. And if we stopped right there, that is an amazing picture of love, but it's incomplete, isn't it? And Paul gives us the complete picture of love when he says, but love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. So in a biblical worldview, love is doing what is best 
for someone else, whether they think it's right or agree with you or not. Did you hear that, church? Love is putting another person above yourself, doing what is right for them, whether they agree with you or not. So in a biblical world view, love requires truth, correction, and admonishing. Do you catch that, church? When we speak truth in love, the reason we're doing it is for the best interest of that other person, even though they don't want to hear it. Church, the most loving thing you could ever do is share the gospel with the world that doesn't want to hear it. That is the greatest act of love we could ever show to the world, is sharing the gospel, even though they don't want to hear it. Why? Love always has correction. Love always has admonishing and building us up and changing our course so we can think correctly according to God's word. In the lives of your children and your grandchildren, if you raise them with never correcting them, that's not love, that's ignorance. That's actually harmful. Harmful. But social justice says love is different. Social justice says it is loving to affirm sin. It is loving the only way we can love. It requires us and demands that the only way we can love is to fully accept everybody's sin and not speak any truth towards it. If you begin to speak out in truth, then you are an oppressor, and that is not loving, when that is the opposite of biblical truth, which says the greatest act of love is this, that a man would lay down his life for another, Christ on the cross, you want to know what it is to be loved? Turn to Jesus. And so it's not about truth and the way the world loves. It's not about being right with God. Don't bring that judgment here. That's not loving. Don't speak that here. That's not loving. And they take... I, I love this quote. There's a quote by Warren Wiersbe. Warren Wiersbe says this, Truth without love is brutality. Love without truth is hypocrisy. This is so, so important for Christians to understand. Truth without love, just to yell, this is what Jonah was guilty of. Jonah was racist as he walked through Nineveh. He hated the Ninevites, so he just yelled, you're going to burn. You're going to burn. You're going to burn. That was his gospel. God in his power and mercy caused every single one of those Ninevites to repent. And Joseph, in his racism, was angry that God didn't destroy Nineveh. He was being brutal to them. He didn't care about their salvation. That's not what we're called to as Christians. Hating others is not what we do. I heard a podcast here a couple weeks ago listening to and studying for today. It breaks my heart. Our younger generations of this church, and I'm not talking like college students, I'm talking like 20s and 30s, of the Church of America are leaving, and there's this popular movement right now, and you may have heard of it, it's called Deconstructing My Faith. And two of the guys that are, are actually at the head of this, and they're pushing this and teaching this, the deconstruction of our faith, walk away from your faith in God, are two guys that were involved, their name's Rhett and Link, and they were involved in children's ministry, they became popular through doing children's videos and music, was, they were great. And they moved to Los Angeles because they got famous, and they're sharing how now they've walked away from their faith. They deconstructed their faith. They no longer have faith in God. And here's why he said this. Breaks my heart. He said, we moved to Los Angeles. And we met a lot of great other content creators. Awesome people. Loving people. And I remember the moment that I realized I'd lost my faith is when one man who was this awesome guy, really nice guy, friendly, loving guy, he comes up and gives me a hug. And in that moment, I realize I'm a Christian. This man's gay. I'm supposed to hate this man. And I couldn't reconcile my faith with how loving this guy was. And so one of them had to go, so it was my faith. I'll tell you right now, he was never a Christian. If he thinks that being a Christian is to hate somebody then I don't know what he is reading in God's word. That is not what we are called to do. That's brutality. 
as Christians, we do justice and we love mercy. To hate somebody like that, I don't know what church he went to, I don't know, but he didn't lose his faith, he never had it. On the flip side of that, on the flip side of that, to love without truth is hypocrisy. And what the church has been seduced into doing is that we have to embrace the world the way that they are. We have to embrace them and affirm them in who they are. I heard one pastor this week evangelizing, street evangelizing, and he said this, I'm not here to say that you're a sinner. I'm not here to tell you that you need to repent. I'm just here to tell you Jesus loves you the way that you are. That is the greatest form of hypocrisy in the world, that the church thinks that it's our actions that are the gospel that it's our our loving people the way that they are as the gospel, just affirming in who they are. That is hypocrisy of the greatest form because a church who's been reformed, who's been reborn and saved from our sin is unwilling to go to the world and say, you need to be saved too. Instead, we hold their hand, we call it love, and we walk them to hell. That's not love. It's hypocrisy when we say, we won't say you're a sinner. We won't say this is wrong. That's not what God's word says, and it's definitely not an act of love for us to remain silent while the world heads to hell. That's not the gospel. And we do that, and the church has embraced this, and it scares me. We do that, and we call it love. A biblical worldview says we know truth through God's word, and you write that down. A biblical worldview says we know truth through God's word. The only way we can know God is through his word. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Social justice says the opposite. Social justice says truth is based on moral authority. Moral authority. That's where we get truth. This is what this means for moral authority. The only way for you to have moral authority is for you to be oppressed. And if you are oppressed, then you have life experiences that give you moral authority. If you are not oppressed, then you have no moral authority at all. And you have no right to speak truth to anybody else. You catch that? And so truth is based on my oppression and how I've been oppressed. And this worries me to the greatest depths because, listen, church. (laughs) This isn't postmodernism. I wish it was. I long for the days of postmodernism. Postmodernism is you have your truth, I have my truth, right? Postmodernism is relativism. Anything could be true. But in postmodernism, at least if you believe that, you and I could sit down and we could have a conversation. I could tell you what my truth is in God's word, that how this is the truth. And despite what you think the truth is, I could show you what salvation looks like. In this new world that we live, they've killed postmodernism. And it's not denied, they no longer deny truth exists. They just deny the fact that you can have it if you're not oppressed. The only way that you can come to truth is through being oppressed. The more oppressed that you are, the more life experiences you have, therefore the more truth you have, no matter what that truth is, that makes your authority more moral. That scares me. That's actually an ancient heresy called Gnosticism. And it's re, it was killed in the second and third centuries by the church, and it's re, rearing its head up now. And that tells you right now, this is all about power structures. And the church, if, it's for, if you share the gospel with somebody, you become the oppressor because you say they have sin. That's oppressing, which means you no longer have moral authority, which means you have no right to share the gospel. It oppresses, and this drives me crazy how can, we not see, how can we not see this? Jesus and the gospel is the only thing in the middle of all this, what they're trying to accomplish is unite mankind to overcome these injustices. The only thing that can accomplish that is Christ through the gospel. Jesus is the only one that breaks down racial division and sexism and racism and all of these things that we're fighting against. Ephesians 2, 14 through 21 says this, for he himself is our peace. That means there is no conflict. Who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. What are the two groups? Historically, it was the Jews and then every other ethnicity. The Jews were one group, every other ethnicity was Gentiles. And 
the Jews hated the Gentiles, the Gentiles hated the Jews, and then in the Gentiles, all the Gentiles hated each other, right? And so we have all of this hostility, and he says, through Christ, he destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh, there's the cross again, the law with his commands and regulations. And his purpose, God's purpose, Christ's purpose through the cross was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. All of these different hostilities, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. The cross is the only way it happens. By which he put to death their hostility. Where does our hate and our sin and our hostility to other people die? On the cross. It unites us with others through Christ on the cross. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners. You're no longer strangers, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. And in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Listen, do you catch this church? The gospel of Christ through the power of the cross unites anyone who believes in Jesus. It breaks down any hostility that was caused by skin color, by ethnicity, by race, by gender. The gospel unites. And in Christ, it tells us in Scripture, there is no Jew, there is no Gentile, there is no Greek, there is no slave, there is no master, there is no male, there is no female. There is just those in Christ. That is the power of the gospel that through the ministry of reconciliation, as we are reconciled to God vertically, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation to help other people get there through the power of the gospel. And what that does is it unites mankind in the supernatural way that only can happen through Christ. You know what social justice does? The exact opposite. Have you heard of this term intersectionality? We are so blind, the world is so blind, as the gospel unites and kills racism and sexism. You know what intersectionality does in the social gospel? It takes all of humanity and divides them and segregates them based on what? The color of their skin. What do we call that? Racism. We look at a people and go, because the color of your skin, you belong to this group. Because the color of your skin, you're oppressed. That's racism. We look at women and say, well, you belong to this group and you're oppressed. We look at people who are immigrants and go, well, you're not a natural citizen, so you're oppressed. And all social justice does is it comes and begins to segregate and divide humanity up based into the categories that we think you should fit into. That's crazy that they think they're overcoming by dividing and segregating. That's not right. The power of the gospel overcomes that and heals that and brings everyone into unity. And it's powerful when we look at the point of the gospel. I love this because there's people way smarter than I will ever be that have dealt with this issue. People that I can learn from, and I hope you do too. I hope you don't just take my word for it, but that you go to God's word. And again, I hope that you wrestle with this. For those that have embraced this, to go, whoa, something's wrong. What's wrong? And for those who don't know why they didn't embrace it, to be able to build that foundation. One of those guys that I've turned to personally, I really enjoy listening to, is Dr. Vodi Bakum. Dr. Vodi Bakum is the dean of the African Christian University in Zimbabwe. And this guy knows his stuff. And I love this quote by him. He says this, if the social justice movement went by its actual name, young Christians would not have been lured into it because the social justice movement is actually cultural Marxism. What's the point of Marxism? To dethrone God. There's no such thing as social justice, people. In fact, in the Bible, justice never has an adjective. There's justice and there's injustice, but there's not different kinds of justice. 
this guy is way smarter than I'll ever be. And there's still four sentence right there has said better than anything I could say in regards to this system, this understanding. But what's happening here and why this is so prevalent is because it seduce, seduces the church. It sounds so good. Like, we're just loving. Like, that's what Jesus taught, right? That we just love selflessly. Like, we just love God and love our neighbors. That's the gospel right there. That's the gospel. We just love and love and love, and that's the gospel. We just love them, and we don't, we don't talk about sin. We don't talk about this other stuff. We just love people like Jesus would love them. So we're saying things like, I'm not, I'm not going to say you're a sinner. I'm not going to say you need to repent. You just need to know Jesus loves you. And it seduces us. Why? Because it's easier to affirm someone than it is to love them enough to say something. And we get seduced in this church and it's dividing inside of the church because those who have embraced that are now looking at the rest of the church and saying, if you don't love the world this way, then you're not a Christian. Oh. No, 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 no. Go back to what I said. If what I think aligns with what the world thinks, which one of us is wrong? It's going to be my thinking. I have a line. If you call somebody else out to love the world the way the world says you should love them, that's not right. God's word says the most important thing we can do is share the gospel. And this is really what it comes down to for me. The church is embracing it. It scares me. Southern Baptists in the convention, there's major leaders who have embraced this. And I think it's coming from a good heart. I think it's a, they're trying to appeal to the world in such a way they go, hey, we understand what you're, what, what you're saying and we want to join you in what you're saying. And they're trying to bring people in. I think it's that way. But what we're really guilty of doing and doing that is softening the gospel, trying to make God relevant to his own creation. That's not okay. We're trying to act, we're trying to act as Novocaine so that when they hear the gospel, it's not as offensive. And that's not okay. We'll find out here in a minute, but it's a doctrine of demons. This is what Paul and Peter refer to. It's infiltrating the church, and it's leading people astray, and ultimately it's leading people to hell in the name of love. And social justice, I think about this, it doesn't... Pick whatever social justice movement you want out there. They're all related, they're all connected, they're all the same philosophy. What they're trying to do, church, we know what the problem is. Sin, and we're going to hell. They're trying to treat cancer with morphine. It feels really good. Right? And it's going to feel good while I go through it. But in the end, I'm going to die because I never addressed the cancer. I never addressed the cancer. And I've had morphine. I don't know if you had. It feels really, really good. And every time I got it, I asked the doctor for more. I'm like, that stuff's good. It's seducing. It makes me feel good about myself because look how loving I am. It's seductive. So, tools for today. So what does this mean for us as Christians? Because we are called to love the world selflessly. But we're not called to join the, church or the world in the way that they do it. We're not called to affirm them. We will not affirm people going to hell. So, number one, Christians, tools for today. Here's what we can do. Number one, Christians must not embrace the social justice movement because it's anti-biblical, it's anti-Christian, and it's anti-God. What we embrace is justice and mercy. And we, my heart breaks for our country right now. My heart breaks for what we see going on. I don't know what the answers are outside of the gospel. We know that. But as far as politically, as far as laws, as far as socially... What I do know is it's not what the world has to offer that's going to make it right. The gospel and the gospel alone. So we don't join them in that. We love more powerful than they ever could. Number two, how do we do it? 
Christians must engage our culture by loving them with the gospel. Christians must engage our culture with loving them with the gospel. And church, this is, we got to call ourselves on the carpet on this one. Let me ask you this. I'm just as guilty as you are probably in this. If our heart really breaks for our world, if our heart really breaks for our nation, and we know the answer is the gospel, when's the last time you told somebody about Jesus? It's so much easier. It's so much easier just to be affirming than it is to speak truth, isn't it? If we have the answer, church, and we want to see the solution, and we're praying for God to move in America, we're praying for God to bring us to repentance, which we should be doing. We're praying for America to turn to Jesus. That's not going to happen if the church is silent and doesn't share the gospel. We have to put action to our faith. We have to engage. Romans 1.16 for I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel, church. Are you ashamed of the gospel? I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. Time out. Right there, we've become oppressors. And I don't care. It's the power of God. It's his power. He is creator, and we are creation. And he has given us the ability to be saved. And I'm not ashamed of his power in what he has done. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then the Gentile. Number three. Number three may be what we really struggle with, what we may need to repent from as a church, as individuals. Number three is this. We must resist, we place the word even repent there, of the arrogant temptation. The arrogant temptation that we could make the gospel more relevant. Do you hear this, church? We must resist the arrogant temptation that we could make the gospel more relevant, as if there is something that Jeremiah, Pastor Jeremiah could do that would make the gospel more palliative for the world to hear it so that they would give their life to Christ. If I could soften it or say it in such a way that it's not like getting in the, hit in the head with the two by four, right? That it's not offensive. If there's some way I can make it more palliative, more just easier, more, less offensive, if I could just soften the blow, that's arrogance and damaging. There is nothing more relevant to all of mankind than its creator. There is nothing more relevant to you and to me and to anyone else in this world than the fact that we can have salvation through Jesus Christ. Nothing else is on the same level of relevance or priority in all of creation. Church, we need to stop thinking there's some way I can say it that's better and just start saying it for what it is. Jesus saves. And what does he save us from? Our sin. And I don't have to live in that sin or die in that sin. Christ died for me. That is the most relevant truth we could ever share. So, as we wrap this up, church, this is important for us to grasp. We love the world selflessly. And we do everything we can to make things right according to God's standards. Because every life in this world that is mankind is a reflection of the Imago Dei, the image of God. But we will not, we will not embrace the world's motives. We will not embrace the world's actions. We must love as the church, and that is completely different than what the world does. And we will not be ashamed of that. We will stand strong on that, and we will share the truth in love that Jesus saves. Let's pray, church. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace and your mercy today. We pray in the midst of all of this, we pray for our nation and the division that's going on. God, we pray for them to repent, to turn to the Lord. But the Lord, the only way they can repent and turn to you is if they hear the gospel. 
And how are they going to hear the gospel if the church doesn't preach it? How are they going to hear the gospel if the church doesn't talk about it outside of Sunday mornings? How are they going to hear the gospel if we as the ambassadors of Christ are not actively sharing it each day? And yet we sit back and we pray, God move. So God, I pray you bring us to a place as believers of repentance that you show us the love that you have for us and that that love overflows for a world that is lost. That in the actions that we have of fighting against oppression and racism and sexism and all the the evils of this world, God, that we're doing it through the power of the gospel, transforming lives from death to life through your gospel. God, give us the ability to think correctly according to your word, to not be okay with seeing the world go to hell, but for thus to see a great revival because the church is faithful in preaching and teaching the gospel. God, we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus today. Amen. Amen, church. Will you stand with us as we continue to worship? And I pray you wrestle with those truths and that God brings us all to the place where we can stand strong on his word. Let's worship. became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so
people who live to lead others to find life in Christ this week, and we'll see you here next week.